we're gonna enjoy this. Oh my god, so dry. I'm at King's Cross St Pancras, about to begin another journey from London, this time taking me all the way to Sweden and of course all by train. So over the next two weeks we'll be taking a total of 10 trains and travelling through four different countries. Here's our route. Our first train is the Eurostar which is taking us to Amsterdam this morning where we'll spend the day and the night before continuing our journey tomorrow. We'll then take a few trains and pass through Germany for lunch on our way to the Danish capital of Copenhagen. We'll spend a couple of days there before taking a short train over the famous Odessund Bridge to Malmo in Sweden where we'll spend another few days then take a fast train all the way up to Stockholm, spend a few days exploring there, then take the new sleeper train all the way down to Hamburg in Germany. Germany, take another train back to Amsterdam and the Eurostar home. So this trip is actually really special because I'm actually Swedish. My grandmother was Swedish, my father was actually born in Sweden, um, but I've never been. So this is my first trip where I'll be visiting friends and family and I get to do it all with my lovely mum. in the centre of Amsterdam around quarter past one. On the Eurostar website, it says that one flight makes up the same carbon emissions from seven trips by train. But when you include getting to and from the airport, it's more like 10. And I've spoken about this before, but I really want to emphasise that the individual carbon savings isn't the only or even main reason to choose to travel by train rather than plane, but more on that later. So we've arrived in Amsterdam now. We're gonna get some lunch. I've booked us a table at a nice vegan restaurant and then we're gonna head to our friend's house. That was such a pleasant journey. We ended up having a whole table to ourselves. As you can see, I got lots of knitting done and I was listening to this really great podcast by The Guardian um, about stalking, so. After lunch, we make our way to the Rijksmuseum because our friend isn't back from work yet. And here you can see the Dutch masters, but I'd also recommend going to the first floor where you'll find works by the Impressionists, galleries devoted to women in art, as well as part of the story of Dutch colonialism in Suriname, told through art. in like my bag and stuff. Good morning. Today is gonna to be the longest travel day on this trip because this evening we're gonna end up in Copenhagen. We're gonna pass through Germany and have lunch there either in the town of Osnabrück or um, Hamburg, which are the two places we stop at. And we're armed with lots of things to keep us busy. Knitting, podcasts, um, my mum's iPad with lots of TV shows and films downloaded, uh, books, so. Yeah, we should have lots to do to keep us busy. To get back to what I was talking about earlier, there's a lot of criticism on focusing too heavily on individual carbon savings or encouraging people to cut their carbon footprint. And this is fair enough, given that too much of this takes the focus away from the fossil fuel companies who are fueling the climate crisis. But the reality is when it comes to aviation specifically, the only way to reduce emissions is to reduce demand. We don't have a green plane waiting in the wings, and it's one of the fastest growing sources of global carbon emissions. So although it only makes a relatively small fraction of overall global carbon emissions right now, it's set to make up a much larger chunk if it continues the way it is. And the problem is mainly caused by leisure trips, so people flying multiple times a year for holidays, rather than visiting family and friends or for business. And as I've said before, not all flights are equal. 
Flying to visit family is very different from flying for a holiday weekend away. So of course we need policy introductions like a frequent flyer levy and a kerosene tax, but we also need a massive shift in social norms away from frequent flying for holidays. And when we choose to travel by train rather than plane, we contribute to that social change. So rather than focusing on the individual carbon savings, which are still relevant, I want to highlight the true power of travelling like this, which is boosting the social change towards low-impact leisure travel. OK, so our first stop, Osnabrück, and I think we're just going to find somewhere to have snack and um, a hot drink, and then we'll have our proper lunch at Hamburg because we have a longer stop over there. So we've got a couple of snacks and we're just sat in a cafe now and I think I would do this a bit differently so I I intentionally got the transfer which had a longer stopover in Osnabrück. There was another train that left about five minutes ago so it only would have been about a 15 minute stopover and I feel like we should have got that one and then just had a longer chunk of time in Hamburg because an hour and 17 minutes really isn't long enough realistically to kind of explore. Osnabrück, but excited to see what these are like. This is a lounge, at, what is it? Lounge as a mid salts. Hmm, kind of like a pretzel. <laughs> so, our train is delayed by. 50 minutes so it's kind of annoying because it means that we won't really get to explore any of the cities in Germany. If we had known about the delay then we probably could have explored Osnabrück. Yeah on the bright side because there's such a long stopover in Hamburg it means that there's no real risk of us missing our third and final train to Copenhagen so that's good. Just got to in that so we're gonna enjoy this. So dry. You're supposed to wear face masks on German trains, so that's why we've put these on. We're at Hamburg and we're going to find another cafe. This is, this is, isn't this Hamburg? Ah! I heard you. Oh my god. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, just a, a, a village or part of Hamburg, you know. This Ooh, is the oh station. my god, thank you so much. Yeah, no. yeah it's Hamburg hub to enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now we're at. <laughs> Now we're at Hamburg. Um, so there's actually, just so you don't make the same mistake we did, or almost did, there are two stations that say Hamburg in them, and you want to make sure that you're getting off at Hamburg Hauptbahnhof, Hamburg HBF. And as you can see, it looks a lot more like a main station. So, yeah, shame on me. Obviously, off my game. This is our third and final train of the day and this journey will take about four and a half hours so we'll arrive in Copenhagen at 9.30 p.m. and our hotel is five minutes from the station so I think we'll just like go straight to bed. This train is very impressive so far. I haven't seen the toilets or the cafe yet but I will show you in a bit but the seats that we have are standard but honestly they're like first class seats beyond first class seats that we would get in the UK. So, I'm very impressed so far. And the tables come with magazines. How nice.
was really pleasant. I mean, the only thing was there was no cafe, which was kind of annoying. But other than that, as I said, the seating was incredibly comfortable. Went by really quickly. We were doing loads. Yeah. The design of these clocks is beautiful. <laughs> we're just heading to our hotel now. Um, and I will check in with you in the morning and probably show you around the hotel a bit. Good morning. It's our first full day in Copenhagen. I'm gonna take you with us a little bit. You guys have been saying that you really enjoy seeing what I get up to while I'm away. So our room's lovely. I will show you around properly at some point. And this stay at the hotel was a birthday present to my mum. And the rest of the time on this entire trip, we're actually just staying with friends and family. So this is um, very much a treat. Anyway, I need to get dressed because my mum's been ready for quite a while now. So. One of the things I think is really interesting about Copenhagen is its commitment to tackling the climate emergency. Cities like this, I think, really should be used as an example of how other cities can move to more low carbon forms of transport. Transport is a carbon bomb in cities. Domination of private cars in cities like London is a huge problem. It's bad for our health. It's bad for the climate. And there's so many things that we can do to move to a more low carbon transportation system. And obviously we're not gonna get rid of cars completely. We need cars, they're incredibly useful for going about our daily lives. We just need to find ways to prioritize journeys that actually really do need a car and make um, other forms of transport accessible for people who, who don't need their cars for certain journeys. 49% of people in Copenhagen commute to work and school by bike and that's because there are so many cycle lanes it's been made a lot safer to cycle here than in other cities like London who are still you know moving in the right direction we've got so many more low traffic neighborhoods and and cycle lanes but it's still so dominated by private cars and all of this needs a combination in really good policy and a change in social norms it's also apparently one of the happiest cities in the world Is that true how do you measure that I don't know. Does that have anything to do with how climate friendly it is? Who knows? But it's pretty cool. And you can really feel it. I mean, I can feel it. I really love the city. You even have bridges like this one, multiple bridges like this one, which are dedicated entirely to people cycling and walking. And I, I think that's amazing. And we need more of this in London.
wanted to say a few words because I'm so impressed, as is my mum. The sheer variety they have in there is astounding. They had, they had pieces that were really philosophical, thought-provoking, and then pieces that were kind of um, looking into the future and um, also kind of looking at the history of design. It was just so... It was... I just, I just feel like I'm, f I'm full of it, you know, <laughs> in a good way. Like I feel filled up with design. So yeah, highly, highly recommend that. So good. Loved it. I'm so obsessed with the Metro here. They've got loads of bike holders at their stations and you can even take your bike onto the trains. Some of the above ground trains have these cleverly designed holders which you can slip your bike into. Also, you can see straight out the front into the tunnel, so it almost feels like an amusement ride. And you can use all of the public transport in the city using the equivalent of an Oyster card. So this is our room and I'm going to give you a little tour. There's so many amazing design details in here like the tall ceilings and the high windows as well as smaller details like this lamp and there's really nice lighting in here as well as a comfy bench here and then there's a kind of separate room for the bathroom over here and it just seems like every detail is very well thought out like the tiling and the shower and all the things in the bathroom are refillable. And then there's a coffee machine here, some drawers here, a very shallow cupboard here. They even give you a steamer and they've left some nice books for us there. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It's our second day in Copenhagen and we've come to see something that isn't your most traditional tourist attraction. Okay, we need to pause here and rewind because yesterday morning before we went out into the center of Copenhagen, we took a trip to see some very special architects. They're called Lenaya and they're carrying out some of the most pioneering work in sustainable building practices in the world. They specialize in reusing and upcycling waste materials for their designs. And to do this, they're not just architects, they actually became material scientists. So they could transform things like old beer containers into new building materials. And on top of this, they're also influencing public policy on construction in Denmark. Okay, now we can go back to this. We've come to Upcycle Studios, which is just outside the kind of city center. So this building is made from recycled concrete, repurposed double glazing windows and discarded flooring boards. I thought that you guys would be especially interested in this because, you know, a lot of you are interested, not just in trains, but in kind of general climate action and sustainability. And um, the way that we build our buildings is crucial to that. They saved 45% of CO2 and turned a thousand tons of waste into building materials. And all with a product which, in my opinion, is beautiful. This is another one of their projects called the Resource Rose, where they used upcycled bricks and waste wood. They also used a recycled concrete beam, which they used as a bridge, and old windows and waste wood as rooftop community gardens. On the train from Copenhagen to Malmo now, we decided to get an earlier one because we realised that it actually gets dark really early and I wanted to show you what the views going over the famous Oresund bridge are like. Um, so this bridge actually connects two countries and the train we're on is a commuter train so it only takes 39 minutes and we've met quite a few people in Copenhagen who actually live in Malmo and commute every single day because it's just so quick. But then I realized I'd forgotten my microphone at the hotel, so I had to run back um, 
and we're probably not going to be able to see it because it's already dark. So the other really cool thing is um, those cards that I showed you earlier for the Metro is kind of like the equivalent to an Oyster card you can actually use for this train, which I find astounding that you can use the equivalent of an Oyster card to get you from one country to another in less than 40 minutes. I mean, yeah, very cool. Today we are going to do the one thing, one activity that I really wanted to do in Malmo, um, which is basically going to what they call the bath. So as you can hear, the wind is a bit much here. So basically going to bathe or going to the sauna means swimming or rather dipping into the freezing cold water of the sea and then hopping into a sauna. And this particular one is a pier or a dock with a building at the end of it, which includes a restaurant and facilities to bathe. What I didn't know is that the Swedes have a tradition of doing this naked. So you have to do it all naked. They do have separate facilities for men and women, although apparently there's a mixed space inside if you want to use that. And it's funny because my mum is going to do this with me and she's more nervous about the cold water and I'm more nervous about being naked. I'm saying here is that I found it incredible and that when you go in you go through the cafe and then into the changing room you have a shower and we went straight into the sauna first there's three saunas all looking out to the sea so you get this amazing view of the sea there's one where you can chat freely one silent one and one mixed one with men and women and after going into the sauna we then walked out to the sea dipped in for literally a few seconds because it was freezing cold and then went back into the sauna and we did that a few times. But yeah, apart from being a bit self-conscious, it was ultimately very liberating. This is our train which is taking us to the furthest point we're going to in Sweden. So it's Malmo to Stockholm. It takes four and a half hours and it's one of Sweden's fast trains, but comparatively to Europe's other fast trains, it's not that fast. A very beautiful train. It looks like an airstream on the outside and I'll show you the cafe in a bit. This one definitely has a cafe because I saw it from the outside. Um... <laughs>
So we're in Stockholm now, as you can probably see from some of the videos. It is freezing. My eyes will not stop leaking, but it's a very pretty city. And right now we're walking to the Vasa Museum, which displays the only almost fully intact 17th century ship which has ever been salvaged. It's a warship called the Vasa, which sunk on her maiden voyage in 1628. And this has been recommended to me by my friend who said it's basically unmissable if you come to Stockholm, just like how the sauna bath experience was unmissable in Malmo. So I have high expectations. This museum is amazing. It's hard to get across the sheer size of the ship here, but you learn about what happened with the ship. So it basically had this major send off in Stockholm's harbor and then 15 minutes into setting off, it toppled over and sank. And apparently this is because the design was flawed. So it was essentially just too top heavy. And the museum shows you how they managed to recover the ship, which is an extraordinary feat in itself. And also what life would have been like on board ships like this. We just had the loveliest detour. We were, we were walking through this park and there's an ice rink just in the center of it. It's so open, you know, there's no barriers. Anyone can just bring their skates and, um, and go on the ice, which I think is so nice compared to so much nicer than it is in London. You can still hire skates. So I had a, I had a quick little skate. It just sits in the city seamlessly and obviously makes so much sense because you don't need as much energy to, to cool it. So yeah, lovely. Mm -hmm. 